scholarships. There's a table back here that you can pick up some information about that. During the week on Wednesday, the Women's Bible Study and the Deer River, Deer River Support Groups will be meeting. Also on Wednesday, it will be Pastor Randy uh, to bring the midweek message sometime this week, Tuesday or Wednesday, whenever that is. And Carol Cox 
Cartwright, I'm happy to say, has, has agreed to continue bringing the Iwana lesson and the uh, adult uh, devotional and piano thing that she does on Thursdays. She's going to continue doing that as long as there is a need for that here and as long as people are, are benefiting from that. And lastly, we've got a couple things just looking forward. Next Sunday, Sunday school resumes. Which also means, you know, adults, students, children, uh, nursery will be there for that. So Sunday school resumes. We're going to have communion next Sunday. And that'll be the end of the service. And for those of you who are watching online, you can participate in the communion. We're going to continue to show that next week. And if you want to come by during the week and pick up the, the little packets, the, the materials for the communion, you can come by the church and do that. Or you can just use whatever you can come up with at home to, to do your communion. So, Lord's Table next Sunday. And lastly, on uh, September 13th, there will be a quarterly business meeting. And so you see the rest of the announcements there. We're grateful and thankful that you're here. And let's enjoy the Lord. Thank you, Jerry. Now I'm going to have you stand, and we're going to sing that song together. I'm going to sing a couple songs. After that, I will be reading scripture reading. And then after scripture reading, I'm going to have you guys sit down, and we're going to sing two more songs. So here we go. <laughs>
is Psalm 27, 1 through 6. Psalm 27, 1 through 6. The Lord is my light and my salvation. O oh, David, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war arise against me, yet I will be confident. One thing I have asked of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. And I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make the melody to the Lord. Thank you, and may God have his blessing on the reading of his word. You may be seated, and may be sit. We're going to sing a couple more songs before the pastor comes this morning. <laughs>
is great uh, in all things. He is always good, always kind, always loving, always gracious, and so much more. Uh, I apologize for the glow coming from my face this morning. <laughs> and you can thank uh, Terry Schrock for that, our coach, softball coach. Uh, we were out all day yesterday. <laughs> so uh, did have a good time of fellowship. We did come in third uh, for the season. So uh, it was a, a good season, a lot of fun, a lot of good fellowship, and even uh, some burning going on. <laughs> Uh, it's always a joy to uh, be able to open up the Word of God with you. Uh, I want to thank you for some time away with the family, uh, though that was cut short with my dad's home going. Uh, it was uh, such a blessing to have a, a church family like ours uh, that, that has uh, surrounded us in many different ways, and we praise God for you. Take a moment and pray together before we uh, open up God's Word together. Father, we thank you for your greatness. Uh, you are so far beyond us in comprehension. So much that we stand in awe of who you are and all that you have done for us, all that you continue to do for us. Father, we know that you are a good and loving God, and we thank you thank you for the glorious gift of salvation, something that has been paid for through the death of your Son, Jesus. Father, we thank you that, that through repentance that we can be redeemed through the precious blood of your Son. And so begins at that moment uh, the good life, a good life that is to be lived in you. So we ask your blessing upon our time together as we open up your word, as we continue to worship, uh, guide and direct us, uh, give me your words, uh, speak through me, your servant, we pray. Uh, work in us, uh, mold us and shape us into the people that you would have us to be in this world. In Jesus' name, amen. I'll take your copy of God's Word, 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. Many of you are familiar with the Declaration of Independence. The Declaration of Independence contains the well-known phrase, life, liberty, and the pursuit of what? The pursuit of happiness. Now, Thomas Jefferson listed these as our unalienable rights. Of course, in our postmodern society, contrary to Jefferson's original meaning, uh, this phrase or these concepts uh, have become all about one's self gratification. Uh, this seems to be the country in which we live in today. Uh, it is all about me, myself, and I. We seem to have confused Jefferson's meaning. Now, chasing after objects of self-gratification, fame, fortune, etc. And for some it is a life of licentiousness, alcoholism, drug addiction. For so many, these things make up a life filled with liberty and the pursuit of happiness. Now, Ernest Hemingway, a 20th century novelist, uh, who wrote several novels, including uh, the famous The Old Man and the Sea, uh, became notorious for his hedonistic lifestyle. Now, Ernest Hemingway had so much money, he spent it on pleasure all around the world, trying to find fulfillment. Uh, trying to find happiness uh, that would last. With little of any regard for the Bible, he continued to pursue a life of self-gratification. None of it gave Hemingway any lasting, genuine happiness. 
that one day in July of 1961, Ernest Hemingway took his own life. You know, if only Ernest would have taken an earnest look at Ecclesiastes. You know, many of you are very familiar with King Solomon, that one who became the wisest man that had ever lived outside of the person of Jesus Christ. A king who pursued everything in the world at trying to fulfill his needs. At trying to find long-lasting satisfaction. Did he ever find it in the world? No. Not at all. All of his wealth, all of the pleasures that he enjoyed were all vanity. Fleeting. Pointless. You now he concluded with these words, when all is said and done, pretty much the good life is lived when we fear God and do what? Obey his commands. When we fear God and obey his commands. That is the good life. That is the good life that, that God wants us to have in this broken and hostile world. According to God's word, living the good life is not living for one's self. It's not a me, myself, and I mentality. It's not keeping up with the Joneses or surpassing the Joneses. It's not pursuing after the things of this world. In God's eyes, it's completely In fact, a good life is all about building into the kingdom of God for the glory of God. Uh, the good life is all about building into the kingdom of God for the glory of God. Now, how often do you and I build into the kingdom of God for our own glory? Now, that's another issue. Uh, that, that's pride. But the good life is truly lived out that when we build into the kingdom of God for the glory of God. This is the abundant life that God has called us to live through him. That's what it is. And don't let anyone tell you differently. You know, if anything, that's why we need each other. Uh, to encourage us, to motivate us, at times to rebuke us into living the good life that God has offered through his son, Jesus Christ. And so here in our text this morning, Peter focuses on what it looks like for the believer to live the good life while being gracious in their broken and hostile world. Uh, we're going to look at four things that we must be living out uh, in order to live life to the fullest for the glory of God. Uh, look at uh, chapter 3 with me, uh, 1 Peter. Uh, verse 8, finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. First of all, we need to have the right attitude. All of these encompass our attitude. Now, Paul says, or Peter says, finally, or to sum up this part of the letter, here's what you need to be doing as believers in Christ. Now, first of all, have unity. Have unity. Have unity of mind. Now, what Peter means here is to, to think the same things. To think and dwell on God's truth to the fullest extent. Uh, to live in harmony with one another. 
committed to the truth of the Word of God that changes the mind. Attitude determines action. You know, in John chapter 17, we have Jesus' high priestly prayer as he cries out to his Father in heaven. And part of that prayer was that believers would be unified in mind, in truth. That we would be unified by the truth of who Jesus is. And that that would be lived out. We are to live life unified as the body of Christ. And the next word he shares is sympathy. Again, an attitude. It means to share the same feeling. And, and so while we are unified in the truth, that we are to be sharing in the pain of those around us. That we are to have the right attitude when it comes to sympathy. Uh, Paul shares in Romans chapter 12, verse 15, that rejoice with those that what? Rejoice. And weep with those that weep. Sympathy. Sometimes that's not an easy thing to do. But God has called us to sympathize with we can rejoice with those who are rejoicing, and we can, we can cry and grieve with those that cry and grieve. Now, the next one is brotherly love. Now, this is the Greek word phileo, which is a friendship love. Now, Peter is speaking to the friendship that we are to have as brothers and sisters in Christ. Okay, and this brotherly love begins right here. With attitude. How we treat one another, how we think of one another. Now, next, a tender heart. Uh, this speaks to an attitude of kindness uh, that is, again, lived out, uh, compassion, a caring heart, uh, being concerned about those around us. Uh, you might say all of these are pretty simple things to understand, but very difficult to live out. And so Peter begins, uh, with the good life begins with the right focus, the right attitude. Uh, in all of these areas in which he shares. And the last is humble in spirit. Humble in spirit. He says, in a humble mind. Uh, in the Greek, this is one word, humble-minded. Humble-minded. Uh, this is the same word that is used in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, uh, where Paul shares that we are to do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit. But in humility of mind, consider one another more important than yourselves. Now, Jesus himself demonstrated this in his lifetime. The fact is this, the joys of a truly fruitful and good life are maximized when we are unified in truth, when we demonstrate care for one another, and when, above all, we are humble like Jesus Christ. So Peter shares, finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. <coughs> have the right attitude. Now, how do we have the right attitude? Well, we... Soak our minds up with God's truth. Amen? And, and, and we live it out. Okay, we, we, we have that mindset from the Word of God. And then we can live it out with the right action. Now, verse 9, we see the right action. 
That right action is motivated by a right attitude. That when we are mistreated by others, how do we respond? Look at verse 9. Uh, do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling. But on the contrary, bless. For this you are called that you may obtain a blessing. And so we need to have the right action. And with the right attitude comes the right action. Again, how do you respond when someone hurts you? Do you become angry? Do you allow that anger to build into bitterness? Now, do you lash out with an unkind action? Uh, do we long to repay evil for evil? Is that what Jesus did? Did Jesus repay the evil that was done against him with evil? He had the right attitude which led to the right action. Now back up to chapter 2, verse 22. It says, He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. That when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. That when he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. You know, the imperative present participle expressing a negative command in verse 9 tells us this. Now, if a believer is not retaliating, don't start it. But if you as a believer are retaliating, you must stop. You must stop. That is not the good life that, that, that God desires for his children. Don't repay evil for evil. And entrust yourself to your Father in heaven as Jesus himself is. Trust him. And don't, don't lash out with unkind actions. Now Peter goes on, in speech do not return insult for insult. Now the Greek word here, insult, speaks to foul language against someone or speaking evil of someone. You know, do you insult those who insult you? I mean, if they... Throw something at you, do you throw something back? How do you respond? How, how do you react in those situations? Or do you give it to the Lord and respond as He would have you to respond? You know, maybe you don't insult them to their face. Maybe you insult them behind their back with other people. Peter says there's no room for that. There's no room for that uh, as a child of the king. Now to engage in such vengeance, whether repaying evil for evil or insult for insult, is an unacceptable response for the believer. <laughs> Colossians chapter 3, verse 8, but now you must put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Now Proverbs 4, 24, put away from you crooked speech and put devious talk far from you. Now again, back to the example of Jesus Christ. 
So rather than retaliating when we are treated poorly, rather than adding insult to insult, now Peter gives us the correct response at the end of verse 9. But on the contrary, bless, for to this you were called that you may obtain a blessing. Now what did Jesus say in the Beatitudes? Bless those who what? Who persecute you. Bless them. And you say, now wait a minute, how, how do you bless someone who is doing evil against you? How, how does that take place? Well, first of all, we demonstrate God's love toward that individual. Uh, by not repaying evil for evil and not insult for insult. Uh, rather, to them or in regards to them by talking about them to somebody else. Okay, so we demonstrate the love of Jesus Christ. And number two, we can pray for their salvation if they are an unbeliever. Pray for them. If they are a believer, pray for their sanctification. That they would grow to become more like Jesus. Another thing that we can do is we can desire their well-being. Long for that. Now, even though they have Hurts, and we can long and pray for their well being. And next, we can forgive them. We can forgive them. That we have been forgiven in Christ. And imagine how much of a debt that was for Jesus. Um, my sin, past, present, and future. Now, on top of that, the, the wrath of God. I mean, if anything, if someone who has hurt us, it should be an easy consequence in light of what Christ has forgiven us that we forgive them. Because what they have done pales in comparison to what I have done. says, on the contrary, bless for this you were called. Be a blessing. Again, God has given us the undeserved blessing of forgiveness. Our sin be so offensive, and yet he has forgiven us. So why can we not forgive someone else who has hurt us? Not repaying evil for evil or insult for insult, but being a blessing. That's the good life. If, if we can live life that way, that's the good life. Uh, right attitude leads to right action. And next, we have the right standard. Now, back to the blessing part. When we are a blessing to others, we receive a blessing from God for doing the right thing. That God is honored by our action when we are a blessing to those who are not to us. And so we have the right standard. Now look at verse 10. Now Paul quotes here from Psalm 34. And for whoever desires to love life and see good days, and let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. And let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. And, and so supporting his exhortation that believers are to have a gracious response to hostility. Uh, he quotes from Psalm 34. Uh, Psalm 34 verse 1 starts out like this. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually proceed from my mouth.
Now, a believer described here uh, as the one who desires life, to love, to see good days, is one who must refrain from speaking anything evil or unkind. Okay, again, this is the good life. And using my lips, using my tongue to speak blessings. We all know that our tongue can get the best of us more often than, than we would like to admit. Okay, look at James chapter 3, verse 6. James puts it this way. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and is set on fire by So Peter says, be careful with your speech. You know, have, have the right standard and, and live by the standard that we have been given in God's Word. And we must commit ourselves to speak the truth and not lie. That lying, deception, and hypocrisy have no place in the lives of God's people. And when they arrive, Because again, we still struggle with this unredeemed humanness that is within us. Uh, that will one day be gone when Jesus takes us home or comes back in the rapture. But until that time, in order to live a good life, that we need to have the right attitude, the right action, and the right. This is the good life. That we are called to turn away from evil and do good no matter what. Verse 11, let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. And that is peace not only with the people of God, but even the enemies of the cross. Verse 12, for the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer. You know, this is the reality that should motivate us to live lives pleasing to God. God, God knows all. He sees all. Now, there's no closet with God. That we are all open books. He sees all things. Peter says his eyes are in are on the righteous, as David shared. His eyes are on the righteous. And not speaking of eyes of judgment, but eyes of, of care and protection. And so as believers, we can be confident that God is watching out for us. And he's waiting and ready to answer our prayers. Okay, he is a good God who offers a good life to those who are in him. Okay, we have to live it out. We, we have to take it in and, and live it out. Last part of verse 12, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Okay, the wrath of God abides on the unbeliever. You know, be thankful that God has been gracious to you, that he has extended his grace, and extend that grace to those around you, that they may see Christ. At last, we need to have the right response. The right response. And with all that goes on in life, and specifically here, persecution. Verse 13, now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? 
But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. Okay, Peter says no matter what happens in life, that we are to make the most of it, again, for the glory of God. Now, we live in a world where it is unusual for someone to treat you poorly when you are doing something good. Of course, that seems to be changing very quickly. It seems our world does not see that any longer. And so often you suffer for doing good. Verse 14, but even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. Now, if you are doing what is right and you are being persecuted, Peter says, don't be afraid. Sending out his disciples, uh, Jesus shared these words in Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. And do not fear those who kill the body, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. Okay, as we live the good life that God intends us to live, as we respond the right way to all that is going on in the world, we have Nothing and no one to fear. And the fact is, as a child of the king, no eternal harm can come to the people of God. Amen? And so how do we respond that when we are persecuted for doing what is right? For standing on the truth. First of all, we need to have a devotion to Christ. Uh, we need to trust ourselves to his care no matter what. And we need to have a readiness to defend the faith. Look at verse 15. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. Now this verse is in reference to persecution that comes as we live the life that God intends us to live. That we need to be ready to give an answer, to give a defense of the hope that is in us through Christ. You know, like a defendant uh, making his defense before a judge, that we are to stand up for Christ and give a reason for the hope. is this, such an oral defense should be consistent with one's conduct. You know, I could give the greatest defense for the Word of God, but if my life and my actions don't live up to that standard, what good does it do? And so as I grow in my walk with God and live the life that He intended, I will be able to give good defense for Jesus. Even in persecution, even in suffering for his glory. Again, 
forgiveness comes with knowing God's word and living it out. And as we defend our hope in a respectful and humble way, we give God honor and glory. As John MacArthur shares, that we must do this humbly, thoughtfully, reasonably, and biblically. So thanks to remember as we seek to live the good life that God has intended us to live, that abundant life, and the fear of man will keep us quiet. But the fear of God and the love of Christ will open our mouths. Okay, never allow the fear of man to creep in. As you seek with God's help, the Spirit's help, to live the good life that God intends you to live. You know, as Pastor Jerry shared last week, the good life begins with repentance, which then leads to redemption. And it is uh, it can continue to be lived out uh, as we build into the kingdom of God. Now that redemption lives to a new way of living life, a different way of living life. How are you doing? How am I doing uh, in living what Peter would call the good life right here, right now, in our broken and hostile life? A couple things to think about. Uh, the gospel never calls us to a life of comfort, uh, but a life of selflessness, sacrifice, and suffering for the glory of God. Uh, the gospel never calls us to a life of comfort, uh, but a life of selflessness, sacrifice, and suffering for the glory of God. Let me ask you the question, will it be worth it all? If this is how we live life, and sometimes it doesn't seem that way. And sometimes it seems as though the world is winning and we are losing. But the battle has already been won. And Jesus has been victorious. And this is a part of the good life. Living a life of selflessness, sacrifice, and suffering. Embrace it. Embrace it for the glory of of God. And it will be worth it all when we see Him face to face someday. Next, as believers, we are to live humbly, responding to persecution in a Christ-like manner and extending God's grace to everyone around us. Now that is so challenging, but it can be done with God's. Now let's live the good life that God intended. And what a difference that will make now and for eternity. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for the good life that we have been given through Jesus Christ, your Son. I have to admit myself so often, I don't live that good life that you long for us to live. I'd rather often focus on myself than the things of this world. Father, help us to live this good life that you have, again, called us to live. And we know that in your strength we can live it out. Father, that we can have the right attitude. That we can have the right action the right standard and the right response even in a broken and hostile world. May we be faithful to you. Give us strength. Give us endurance to run the race that has been set before us. And to run in love to seek the good life that we have in Christ. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand and sing our closing song.